Welcome, voice friends, to another episode of Interviews on Voice Matters. Today we have Ian Howell with us, and he is the Director of Vocal Pedagogy at the New England Conservatory of Music. And I, for one, am very excited to have Ian here because I have read his dissertation, and it's mind-blowing, all kinds of new ideas and, and wonderful things to think about. So thank you, Ian, for being here today. Absolutely, Liz. Happy to be here. I wanted to kind of quote off of New England's website, and it says that your research focuses on practical applications of a timbre-based framework for hearing vocal registration events. Just rolls off the tongue. <laughs> right, doesn't it? <laughs> Um, I have to admit, I in reading your dissertation, I took copious notes, so I may be quoting and asking you about some of those things. How fun. <laughs> yeah, here. Um, but Ian is also a countertenor and a very accomplished singer as well, so he's got the art and the science both going on. So um, my first question for you, Ian, is how did you get into the realm of voice science? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think of myself as somebody who was a, a good singer and a bad teacher up until I was about 28 or 29 years old. So I, I, I had like good technique for the level of gigs that I was doing and, um, you know, was able to, to meet my needs either as a, I was a backup singer in like a Calypso band that I played steel drum in in my early 20s and I did mm -hmm. a singer songwriter thing um, in my early and mid 20s and was certainly doing a lot of choral and, and early music small ensemble singing at that time in my life. Um, I got into Chanticleer when I was 25 and that just the rigors of doing that gig and singing that much and rehearsing that much every week really uh, had a, a substantive effect on building my instrument. Like I, I really ramped up my voice use. Um, and when I left the group when I was about 29, I went to do my master's at Yale and I, I feel like I finally started working with some teachers at that point who <laughs> were um, smart about the process of singing and about the process of training the voice. So in some respects, I came to, in my mind, singing well a lot later than mm -hmm. a lot of people do now. Certainly a lot later than most of the students that I have at New England Conservatory right now are, are coming to it. Um, I got interested, as I was doing my master's degree, I got interested in just starting to read the research that was out there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, starting to read stuff by Ingo Tita, starting to read stuff by Scott McCoy, starting to read Journal of Singing. Um, I don't think I knew about Journal of Voice until probably I was in my mid thirties um, when I was living in Philadelphia, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think just like the way my, my mind is put together, just the, like the mechanics of my brain, I really gravitated towards, ooh, this formant thing is interesting. Like, what can I learn about this? And so I did the same thing that everybody does who decides they want to start understanding vocal track formants, which is that you you just throw yourself against the literature and the literature just crushes you. <laughs> you know, it's a really confusing topic to make any sense of, um, especially because it's like, hey, there are these things that are real and you can measure them, but I have no idea how my experience of them actually like, manifests in my body. Or I have no idea when I'm listening to a singer if they're necessarily doing the formant tuning correctly. Like there was, to, to me, I came to realize that there was this gulf between what the science was telling us and how we all actually thought about it as singers. Somebody like Ken Bozeman is actually doing a tremendous job in trying to bridge that gap um, with both with practical vocal acoustics, uh, which came out a couple of years ago, and with his new book, which just came out, um, Kinesthetic Voice Pedagogy. Um, I will say probably the most, in terms of me, like being a voice scientist, I don't really know that I consider myself a voice scientist, like I'm a singer who's really curious about a bunch of stuff, so I'm, I'm able to explore sort of at my own pace. But um, when I did my doctorate, I went back in my late 30s and did my doctorate actually here at NEC, and I just had a couple really formative teachers, mm. um, and they were formative in to a certain extent in like the information that they gave me and like the, the methodologies that they exposed me to. But I, I think we all have like a couple, a couple mentors in our life whose voices we keep hearing, yeah. like whenever we come across new information or, or think we've figured something out, like then there's that person in your head who's like, 
but did you? You know, and then you have to like really think through their process for uh, evaluating whether something's true. And I, I had two such teachers in my doctoral work here. One was uh, Dr. Helen Greenwald, who's a member of the musicology faculty here. And so from a musicology point of view, she, like you, you read all these journal articles that it's like, oh, there's this analysis of this piece and there's this one rhetorical gesture that's used in a certain way. So therefore it means this. Mm -hmm. or like expectation is set up in music and then you defy the expectation and it creates a certain um, meaning in the mind of the listener. Um, and she would always, like her mantra was always comma, but what does it sound like? You know, it, like it's very easy to dive into the world of musicology and just get wrapped up in the intellectual process of it, but yeah. she forced everything, and maybe it makes sense because it's a conservatory, so we're all players. Um, but she forced everything to then be in the context of the actual experience of the music, which is, it, it's like such a simple thing that it's kind of radical to, to actually demand that. Um, and then the other person is a, a gentleman named Robert Kogan. So Professor Robert Kogan is a member of our music theory faculty, mm -hmm. somebody who I, I quote and cite pretty extensively in my dissertation. So you may have seen his name. Um, and he studied with Roger Sessions at Princeton, in mid um, early 20th century. And he became just fascinated with the idea of timbre. So, mm -hmm. you know, like he, you know, starts with Mach, Ernst Mach and Helmholtz in the 19th century and moves forward through a variety of, of thinkers in the field of psychoacoustics in the 20th century, because he was trying to like nail down an answer to the following question, which I hope I'll phrase well, which was basically that you know, I don't have any sheet music around me, but if we all imagine a, a page of sheet music, mm -hmm. like, that is not, that is not a, a way to capture sound. That is not a way to capture color, timbre, expression, anything. It is a set of instructions right. for, to create, like to go through the mechanical process that creates the sound. So in, in his mind, like he struggled to come up with a way to notate sonically relevant aspects of, you know, essentially 20th century academic art music. He, he wanted to come up with a way to note, notate relevant elements of musical structure and relevant elements of sonic design mm -hmm. that elude standard music notation. So even something as simple as like, you know, if you have an accent over a note or a piano versus a, a fortissimo, um, you know, each of those instructions on the same instrument, it's going to cause a different timbral, timbral response, right? A, a right. flute playing piano is not the same spectrum as a flute playing, playing fortissimo, just quiet. It's like the, the actual spectrum itself is different in terms of where the, the strengths are in the harmonics. And so when, when spectrographs sort of came out, he was like, sign me up. And he actually had one of the first um, machines that was like smaller than a room um, that IBM made and IBM actually partnered with him and the New England Conservatory and like he had this technology here and just started creating these books about um, the role of of timbre in music analysis and like started journals about this and he's just published so much and I would encourage anybody out there who's interested to look into his writings because he's one of the most lucid lucid writers on complex subject that I've ever come across. So then when I come and take his doctoral seminar here, m my mind is al already armed with, you know, I've read Resonance and Singing and I'm fluid with Voce Vista and I understand that book and I understand the technology. I've read, you know, all of the articles that I could get my hands on about uh, resonance strategies and formant tuning and all these things. And I've read all the Sundberg science of the singing voice material about you know, the significance of the singer's form and cluster and this and that. And I've read all the Miller, the, the um, Richard Miller uh, studies about, you know, vowels and their, their spectra and whatnot. And, you know, then I, I get to his class and he is using the exact same technology to a completely different end. And, and so like I was forced to see all these spectrograms of singers through his point of view which is that there's, you know, there's a, a relevance to the psychoacoustic scale of brightness, for example, and that you can divide 
frequency bands into like what he called grave, which are very low, dull tones, and neutral, which are sort of um, mid-range tones, and acute, which are very high frequency tones, and that there are qualitative timbral differences to those regions. Um, yeah. Which, you know, if you think about any chapter that you would read on formants, I, I just, beyond using the word bright, I don't know that anybody talks about the fact that, well, you know, if you have, if you have spectral peaks in this part of the spectral envelope versus this part of the spectral envelope versus this part of the spectral envelope, that you can like objectively talk about those regions as having separate timbres, that you can, you can talk about their individual contribution to the overall um, tone color of the singer that you hear. And, and really, if you think about it, like if, if what you care about is, and I'm gonna do Ken Bozeman's hand signs because I just think they're great, like if this is your formant and this is your first harmonic and your second harmonic, if we're going to spend all this time talking about that, which is one right. H two coupling, or this, which is what a lot of baritones and tenors do through their passaggio, or this, which is what a lot of female classical singers do, mm -hmm. if we're going to bother to think about sort of the granular level of formant and harmonic interaction like that, I think it behooves us to ask the next question, which is, well, what does it sound like, and can we come up with a set of labels? that allow us to talk like to one another about the sound of whoop. Like what is the sound of whoop? Because that's ooh whoopy. Mm -hmm. That's e whoopy. Like and they're totally different sounds. But they have both accomplished a coupling of F1 and H1. Um, but if you can just pay attention to what H1 objectively sounds like, and you have a label for it, and because you have a label for it, this is the way the mind works, because you label it, then you notice it, mm -hmm. um, then all of a sudden you, you can talk like more productively about whether the person has accomplished whoop on those two vowels. So I don't know, I'm, I'm not Elon Musk in any respect, but he said this one thing I heard on a recording, like an interview that he gave. Mm -hmm. That the, like the way that you do something interesting in life is you become an expert at one thing and then you go and become an expert at another thing and then you notice the way those two things talk to one another so i think for him it was like he became an expert in rocket science and then he became an expert in batteries and so like everything that he does now flows from the intersection of those two disciplines so a little bit i feel like like i'm try i put a lot of energy into trying to understand just the way the voice science considers acoustics and mm -hmm. resonance strategies. Mm -hmm. And then I put a lot of energy into considering the way uh, psychoacousticians and spectral music composers and, and the way that people who were just thinking about qualities of sound thought of tone, color, and timbre. And I think there's this really interesting, fruitful mingling of those two intellectual spaces because everybody's using the same technology. <laughs> like they just don't talk to each other. That's the problem. So describe what you mean by psychoacoustics really quick for, for those. I read your dissertation, so I understand a lot more about it now. But at first, the word struck me as interesting because I hadn't really heard it before. Yeah, it's a great word, isn't it? Because um, it makes you think like, right, right, right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so th this is my philosophy on the nature of sound. Mm -hmm. it, like, I'm very much a tree falls in the forest, if there's nobody there to hear it, it does not make a sound kind of guy. Okay. Um, think about this, so everybody can do this at home, and this is, this is a, great, a great quick apprehension example of this. If you take two pencils and put the tips really close to one another, you can, if you have long enough fingernails, you can even do this, and then poke the pad of your index finger mm -hmm. with the pencils, you'll feel two points. Mm -hmm because there's a lot of nerves in this finger, it gives you a lot of sensory information. Mm -hmm. if you do the same thing in the back of your neck, you'll feel one point because you just don't have a lot of nerves on the back of your neck, because mm -hmm. it just doesn't matter. Like we don't need that specificity. Um, what changed was not the objective number of pencil points. There were still two pencil points. Mm -hmm. What changed was your sense of touch, um, the word is mediated. Your sense of touch processed the mm -hmm. objective information mm -hmm. and created an image in your mind of what reality was. 
So the, the word for that is percept. And I know it's kind of a weird word, but it's just, it, it just means exactly that. It's like the noun version of the thing you're perceiving. Yes. Um, so your percept changes when you go from here to here. Reality mm -hmm. doesn't change. So all of our senses do that. Like think about, uh, I ride a commuter rail in Boston, right? So when the train is far away, it looks like there's one light on the top of it. And then as mm -hmm. it gets closer, you realize it's two lights that are actually kind of close. That's a limitation of the eye. Mm -hmm. So your percept of the train light changes. The train always has two lights. Um, sound waves are exactly the same. So they're like basic limitations to the way that the inner ear processes sound. Mm -hmm. Because like the ear is a physical system. And because the ear is a physical system, it has like, there's physical tolerances to the way that it moves as you excite it with a sound wave. And so that changes the way that that physical movement is translated into neural activity. Mm -hmm. And because of that, that, that means that there are basically like obligatory ways that we hear sound. So okay. for example, there, there's this idea of something called acoustic roughness, mm -hmm. which is if you have two sine waves that are close enough in terms of their interval, mm -hmm. close enough frequency is another way to think about it. There'll be like a mm -hmm. kind of quality to the sound. Mm -hmm. if they're far enough apart. Instead, there'll be a pure quality to the sound. Um, essentially, like from the fifth harmonic and up in the harmonic series, all the harmonics of the voice are close enough that they'll cause this phenomenon of roughness. Mm -hmm. So if you look at Look at a spectrogram of like an elite classical tenor singing a high B flat four. Um, they'll have this pronounced singer's formant range. Yeah. And all of those harmonics will be higher than the fifth harmonic in the series. Mm -hmm. So they'll automatically be rough. Like it's not possible for them to not be rough because it's the way that the ear processes the sound. Okay. So psychoacoustics is essentially, it's just the study of the way that the ear processes sound. Okay. The, way, the way that the ear introduces qualities to the sounds that we hear, some of which are not actually present in the sound wave itself. So like the ear is a co-equal partner mm -hmm. in creating the sound of a singer. And I like to think of it in terms of that means that if we understand how the ear processes sound, we can understand what sounds the human voice is capable of making. Right? Right. If, if the voice makes a compression wave that the ear can't process and perceive anyway, is the voice making that sound? <laughs> like, right, right. I just don't think it is. Um, so that's what psychoacoustics is. It's literally the study of how we process sound. Okay. It's significant. It's not incidental to the way that we hear, and it's certainly not incidental to the way that we hear singers. That's fascinating. I think that's one of the big topics I took from your paper was we're dealing with so many issues here, right? And one of the big things I realized is that it's not just the sound that we're making, but how we perceive that sound. And we have to talk about how we're perceiving it. So one of my questions um, is how do you teach your students to hear these different sounds? And do you consciously teach your students how to hear these different sounds now that you understand them better and have started to create some labels for them? Do you mean, so I teach studio voice here at NEC and mm -hmm. I also, I run the, the vocal pedagogy program and I teach all those classes as well. Do you mean in the classroom or do you mean in the teaching studio? In the teaching studio. So if you're working with a singer and you're asking them to start to recognize certain harmonics or the interaction with the harmonics and the, the formants, yeah. are, are you able to teach them how to hear those things because of the language that you've created? Yeah, so this may surprise some people who either have seen me present or read something that I've read, but I almost never use technology in the teaching studio. That was another question. Thank you. <laughs> I think it's a huge distraction. Really? It's a huge distraction for, for two primary reasons. One, a spectrogram is, a, it's essentially a mirror. You know, mm -hmm. at, like as a piece of technology, it's equivalent to a mirror. And like, would we ever require our students to just sing into a mirror for an entire lesson and expect that they would get something meaningful just from the act of singing into a mirror? Now, if you say, okay, Liz, I'm teaching you a voice lesson and I'm really curious whether we can cultivate an awareness that on every breath you let go, 
with your lips or something really weird like that. And so maybe I'll give you that directive, like look in the mirror for this. Mm-hmm. And then it'll serve its purpose. And then we take the mirror away mm-hmm. because we don't sing with mirrors when we perform. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, generally we don't. So I, I think at its root, like if you have a spectrogram and you want to use it in a lesson, like use it for a specific targeted reason, mm-hmm. but we're presuming that the student knows what to look for. So like that, that's the first hurdle. Yeah. If, like I, I'm to the point where I can, I can like read, excuse me, I can read spectrograms and like I know what the vowels are and I could even tell the difference in terms of like qualities between like, oh, that's a slightly brighter ah, uh, or that's really, it's morphed to an ah uh, at this point. And like I can, I can just do that because I've been doing it long enough. But that took like a couple of years. And so I would never presume that a student would get something out of looking at a spectrogram mm-hmm. if you have that basic um, knowledge base. But the other thing is, is it, it takes them out of time. You know, it's like singing is a process that's always about planning the next moment and then the next moment and the next moment and the next moment. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for centuries, people have been writing about this. Like this is not news necessarily. And a spectrogram, a spectrogram tells you what last seconds sound was. And so like, just like singing just for the sound of the room, mm-hmm. I think singing just for the thing you see on a spectrogram is equally disruptive just to the underlying process of singing. I will say this. So um, one, one of my, one of the things that I work on is this concept called absolute spectral tone color, which is just that any, any narrowly filtered uh, band of frequencies. So you can think of like a, a harmonic of a voice is just a narrow band of, of uh, compression energy in a sound wave uh, is going to exhibit a specific um, tone color that you can apply a label to. And if you have that exact same narrow frequency band from another sound source, like, notch filter, an airplane taking off, um, do a motorcycle going by, a baby's cry, your voice, my voice, a kazoo, like it doesn't matter. If you just listen to that band of sound, it's gonna mm-hmm. exhibit this tone color. Um, and so for, for the female voice, I'm personally fascinated by the female and countertenor voices. Um, once you get into what we call whoop resonance, so your F1 is aligned with your H1, mm-hmm. and then you figure out how to sing through your entire range while still boosting this harmonic. Mm-hmm. That harmonic, as it rises and falls, passes through a couple tone color labels. It doesn't mm-hmm. stay the same as pitch rises. Mm-hmm. It changes at about C5, and then it changes again at about F sharp five. Um, so one of my favorite things is I get emails maybe every four or five months from former students who, like, they follow the, the following formula. They're like, I was at this rehearsal or this performance and then like in all caps, they'll write, and I finally heard the ooh is what they'll write because like they finally heard like an elite female singer who was doing this whoop resonance and they heard that 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 H1 sounds like ooh, for example. Um, So like in that respect, I I do think it's helpful to like know that this structure is out there. Um, And I'm excited when my students come to that realization. Um, I will say I save almost all of that stuff for the vocal pedagogy classes. Okay. I might say something like, you know, if if a a singer is, like if they're giving me that sort of, like things are too tight back here, Mm -hmm. like you're doing fine on the E part of the sound, I'm missing the warm whoa part of the sound. Mm. I'm missing the warm part. And so we're going to do this physical thing, but I want you to invite the warm part. <laughs> like the, the change in sound that was substantive was yeah. in the warm part of the sound. So I'll use labels like warm, clear, bright, edgy. I'll use terms like that, that I know in my mind what I'm trying to elicit. And I'll know based on the tone color of the harmonics that it should amplify if they do it correctly. Uh, I'll be able to tell whether they've done it right. I don't force them to know. And, and I think people who, who think on that level are, are complicating the process for their students. Mm. You know, w- would you force them to understand exactly the sensation of the various layers of your abdominal musculature? <laughs> or, or do you just want the right tone in those muscles generally? Like, is that, 
is that simple command of like, let's just have some tone in those moments. Is that sufficient? And I think the tone color stuff, it's almost always sufficient to just think in terms of like warm, clear, bright. Right. Fuzzy, not fuzzy. That's sufficient. Right. Right. So what we're talking about is a huge gap between all of the scientific research knowledge that we're gaining and understanding that we're gaining and then actual practical application in the studio. And I think that's a, that's a universal struggle. Yeah, I think it is. And I think, um, <clears throat> I think there's space for people to sit in between those two communities. Yeah. And like, to a certain extent, translate information but also you know, give people permission to not have to understand everything right away. Like I feel like there, and I've been both of these people in my life, like I feel like there's a group of people who are very good teachers and have very cohesive approaches. Yes. And you know, they feel like they're already an expert. And so to evaluate this body of knowledge over here that's all about harmonics and formants and resonance tuning strategies and all these things that our objective measurement devices tell us are true. Um, I think it, it's easier for this group of people to sort of become hostile towards this information than it is for them to go through the, the deep painful slog of really thoroughly understanding and confronting whether this information is true or not. So I, I think right. there can be people in the middle who are like respected by both communities. So again, Ken Bozeman is a great example of this um, because he's respected by voice teachers and singers and he's respected by the voice science community. Like, I think, I think those are the people that actually make the information applicable and, and make it relevant to the broader community of voice teachers. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think that's a great point that, that one, there is a divide you know, as we're talking about, and two, that there are ways to get through it, but it's painful, you know, I, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy for anybody to get to that information and you just have to be patient with yourself and the process and keep reading. It sounds like you've done a ton of reading. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of reading. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for saying that. That's all I'm, that's all I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I don't know. I, I wonder a lot about what the nature of expertise is, like just mm -hmm. as a concept, what does it mean to be an expert? Right. And, and I think those people who have been fortunate enough to, you know, spend their lives buried in books and like really striving to deeply understand so those people who have managed to change our perspective on something. Yeah. And there's like four of them. Like, like it's, it's not a big group of people who, who can really just shift the perspective and the consciousness of an industry, right? The only reason we take them seriously is because they so thoroughly understand the material that their perspective shift like slightly contradicts. They so thoroughly understand and have a command over the material that they're confronting and pushing back against. Mm -hmm. that everybody is like, well, clearly this should be a new way that we think about this. And, and so, you know, for anybody, for anybody on this, the sort of voice science side of it to say, well, this should be practically applicable if they're not already an excellent voice teacher is madness. And for anybody in the voice science side of things, I'm uh, sorry, on the voice teaching side of things to say, well, you know, all this research about whatever resonance strategies or harmonics or performance or whatever you want to fill in that's like complex voice science stuff. And it, like none of that research is practically applicable. Like they literally can't say that unless they actually thoroughly understand the voice science stuff. And, and so, like you say, we just have these two camps of people that are really good at what they do, but not good enough at the other thing to um, really filter and translate the information and be able to talk to one another. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, it's a huge problem. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, that's why I'm so excited about the field personally is because we have a lot to talk about and there's a lot to do and there's a lot of, there are a lot of bridges to build and there are a lot of um, wonderful conversations to be had, which is why we're here together. So thank you. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, I have one question about your paper. One thing I did notice is that you never, ever use the word vocology. You always use the word voice science or use the words voice science. Mm -hmm. And I know you're very intentional about what you do. And so I was just curious as to why you made that decision. 
gosh, you've stumped me, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so vocology. Conscious choice. So, so vocology is a relatively new term. You know, yeah. it's it's and and I like it because it, it's very specific. It's talking about voice science, and it's one word instead of two. And I like Ingo a lot, and I I think it's wonderful to to have this new field of study. Um, so, but it's it's relatively new, and I'm I'm wondering like. Is there like a cultural pushback against the word? Are people using it more? Oh. Like, like where does it where does it fit for you? Well, so if vocology is the the study of voice habilitation and rehabilitation, like I, uh, I mean, I think hearing and perception completely locates itself within vocology. Mm -hmm. I, I think. Again, if the ear is a co-creator of mm -hmm. the sound, then anything having to do with the sound, we also have to talk about the ear. Mm -hmm. um, I think if I, if I write voice science, like as a, hey, here's some voice scientists who say X in my dissertation, like it's really more, those are people who either by philosophy or just by the scope of the, the literature that I'm quoting, are not taking as comprehensive a view. Like that, that would be my guess. Okay. That would be my guess. Because, you know, if you read Vocology or Principles of Voice Production, like Ingo and, and Kitty, like they talk about um, hearing, they talk mm -hmm. about the ear, they talk about, you know, audiology, even as like the word was the, the term that they used to say, like, oh, we should call this vocology because it's about the voice rather than, yep. you know, solely about hearing. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that that was a conscious choice. I think I just did it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm fascinated with the word, which is why it caught my attention too, because I, I think in a lot of ways, we're still trying to figure out what that means. And, and you're, you're correct. I think, and Ingo says this as well, that audiology is the most closely linked field that we have to vocology yeah. for all the reasons that you stated too. So, all right. Thank you for entertaining that idea or that. No, it's a fun idea. And I think I also, it, if I remember, it's been a little bit since I've read it, but I think I, I'd sort of define voice scientists as one aspect of the literature or mm -hmm. what voice scientists do as one aspect of the literature than what voice pedagogues do as another aspect of the literature. Just like ge generally a lot of the stuff I wrote in the dissertation, I'm, I'm interested in trying to push some ideas into like not necessarily the science literature, but just vocal pedagogy textbooks that we use. Yeah. You know, like that, that's the level that I'm thinking on. So. Okay. I think that's probably why I summarized it like that. Okay. Um, and just in general, I'm asking everyone, what is your take on the future of voice science or vocology? Where do you think we're headed? Oh God, I have no idea. <laughs> it's way too big. I don't know. Yeah. And, and just even, um, I think the things that we weren't thinking about 10 years ago that are now important, um, I, I would never imagine that that would stop. So I, I don't, I don't know that I could imagine what the field will be as a field. Mm -hmm. um, I can, I can certainly say that I'm personally interested in like pushing the agenda of practical applications of cycloacoustics and making sure that everybody like not only intellectually understands that oh, there's an equal loudness curve and that's why the singer's formant is so strong, but, but actually experiences the sound of it and not just intellectually understands that maybe there's darkness and brightness in sound, but can actually experience the sound of it as a part of their education. Um, so I, I can certainly you know, speak to what I'm gonna try to do to, mm -hmm. to push that little tiny sliver of the field forward, but mm -hmm. I don't know. I think it's exciting that I don't know <laughs> like what the field generally will do. So I'm going to ask one more question and this is, it's kind of a big one. So just, just go with me here. At the beginning of the dissertation, you mentioned this um, William Bernard and you have a quote here yeah. that I love. It says, Bernard threw down a gauntlet that remains on the ground today. Yeah. Why it goes unnoticed and how one may rise to his challenge are important questions to contemplate. Yes. What exactly did he throw down and what do we need to be paying attention to? Oh, what a great question. Okay, so William Bernard wrote this big book um, called Singing, colon, The Mechanism and the Technique. And, um, 
anybody a generation older than me, like that was the voice pedagogy textbook you would use in your coursework. All my teachers, that was the book that they used. A number of people still use it, it's a great book. Um, he takes a really thorough whack at explaining spectrographic analysis of, of the voice, mm -hmm. spectrographic analysis, particularly of vowels. And he, you know, it's like you, when you're doing a research paper, if you like, ding, you come up with an idea, like one of the first things you do is you scour the literature to make sure somebody else hasn't thought of it <laughs> already. Right. And um, so as a part of scouring the literature to see if I'd actually come up with something original, like, of course, Bernard had thought of it first because he tends to think of everything first. But there's a, there's a page where he shows like really rudimentary schematic representation of the spectral peaks of um, the Italian cardinal vowels. And he, he compares, he puts together two pairs. One of them is E and U, and mm -hmm. the other one is um, A and O. And if you look at those vowels spectrographically, this is generalizing, but generally what you'll see is E and U both share a common first spectral peak. Mm -hmm. So I, I tend not to talk in terms of, of formants necessarily, because I think what matters is what the formants do to the harmonics. So if you're singing a low enough pitch, the first formant of U and E will cause a peak in the harmonics mm -hmm. um, that it, it's basically like the same. So mm -hmm. E will have some higher frequency harmonics that U doesn't really have, mm -hmm. but they both have this lower spectral peak. Mm -hmm. And then it's the same for O and A. Um, they, they'll share this common lower spectral peak. And so Bernard, he says something, uh, like I just have to imagine he was sitting at his typewriter and he sort of threw this off as a matter of course, and like he never comes back to it. But he just says that, you know, okay, so if U and E both share this common first spectral peak, that means that, that E is an U with additional higher harmonics. And A is an O with additional higher harmonics. And that's like, that's, that's the core of my thesis, is that you can take the spectral envelope of a vowel, any vowel, and you can break it apart into perceptually relevant smaller units. Mm -hmm. And if you just label those things, then you hear them. So this is why my students email me after they've left NEC and they're like, oh my God, I heard the ooh, you know, cause you can hear this ooh that underpins everything up to about the pitch C5. Um, and, and so that was the gauntlet. So Bernard, is, Bernard basically says, hey guys, an E has an ooh in it. An A has an O in it. And and then we just ignored it. <laughs> like nobody picked up on that idea, as far as I can tell. Um, at least in, in print, nobody picks up on this idea right. that um, vowels are made of like smaller discrete units. Mm -hmm. They're like Lego blocks. You know, you can, you can recombine them in a variety of ways. And it just depends on which Lego block is loudest. will tilt our, our percept, our perception toward this vowel label versus this vowel label. Right. So that's I, read. I, I don't know. I felt, I, I felt good about myself when I came up with that line that Bernard has thrown down a gauntlet. I, I like, I remember exactly where I was when I wrote that down. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Yeah. I appreciate you picking up on that. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. I have, I have a whole list of quotes that I, that I copied down from your paper. So I think you just answered the question too. Like where are we headed? We're headed toward more understanding, more labeling yeah. and, and hopefully deeper, ability to hear these things or more ability to hear these things, you know? So. Well, and you know, for me, Liz, I think a lot of it comes down to there's a relationship between the technology creators and the people that, that utilize the technology and research. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like somebody like Donald Miller it is to my mind kind of rare because he was doing the primary voice research, the voice science research. Mm -hmm. And then he needed to create the technology to keep doing it. And that's why we have Voce Vista. Like he was deeply integrated in both aspects of it. But mm -hmm. I think for a lot of us, we take what comes off the shelf and we see what we can do with it. So I was introduced to this software called Overtone Analyzer that was authored by this German gentleman named Bodo Maas. And 
randomly of all the spectrographs, of all the spectrographic software that's out there that one could buy, he decided to include the ability to do notch filters. And he made them easy. Wow. And he made it easy to do a bunch of them on the same envelope. And he made it easy to independently control the volume of the output of each one of those filters. So all of a sudden, you know, if Venard had this software, he would have plugged an E into it, put a filter over the part that are these extra higher harmonics, and he would have just made it quieter. And by making it quieter, the ooh part of the sound would have emerged and he would have been like, yes, we should all talk about this now. But it's just, he didn't have the technology. Right. Or, or you know, notch filters is not a new idea. It's not like Photomouse came up with the idea of notch filtering um, right. part of a spectrum, but he made it easy. And so because it was easy, I ran with it and was able to, you know, everything that's in the paper is basically because I was able to, to utilize this technology to quickly demonstrate and, and as much as one can prove anything, like just yeah. come close to suggesting that maybe it's true, <laughs> what I'm talking about. Yeah, once again, proving that we all need each other. This is a group effort. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and like, I cannot recommend this software enough. What is the Overtone Analyzer. Okay both because it's a great software mm -hmm. and, and also because the developer is really, uh, Bodo is really responsive. Like I've had a number of conversations with him and he's been responsive to like um, feature ideas for future versions. And there's been great moments where I'd email him and like, I really need to do this. And he emails me back and he's like, just press the C button. Like, like some stuff is already in, but he's been really tolerant of my learning curve <laughs> with the software. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> How great. I'm going to definitely put a link to that in the, in the bottom of the YouTube video here too. And for anybody who's currently a Voce Vista user, and Voce Vista is a great software as well, um, Bodo is the guy who's coding the new version of Voce Vista. Okay. So I think those two softwares and their functionality are going to merge in some way in the coming Together. years. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, this is very exciting. Yeah. And, um, I'm hoping that in the near future, you'd be willing to talk with me again as you learn more and, and I have better questions come up. Um, you have great questions. <laughs> well, thank you. And, and I just, I think this is an ongoing conversation and, and just really interesting to, to document how people get to where they're going or how they get where they are yeah. and what they're interested in. And so um, if you're amenable, I would love to speak with you again at some point in time. Absolutely. 100%. Okay, great. And for all of you uh, budding researchers out there, I'm sure Ian is willing to take your questions and to, I mean, I don't want to flood your email box. Oh, but. no, no, that's great. Well, and, and beyond that, I mean, just if I can advertise for a second, yeah. at the conservatory, we have um, basically within the voice program, there's like three degrees that somebody could do if they're interested in coming and working on this kind of research. I mean, we have a, a voice performance track. Mm -hmm. A lot of the voice performance majors come and interact with me in the lab or in the classes, and you can do a minor in voice pedagogy if you're a performance major. We have a vocal pedagogy master's degree, which is still very performance focused, but carves out a little more time to get deeper into the, the science and the psychoacoustics of the voice. And we're actually admitting our first class of, of doctoral students in a new track this fall. So we, we've had a doctoral program since I think the 70s, and we've always had voice performance as one of the, the possible tracks, but uh, we've expanded that. So now we have a performance and pedagogy track mm. simultaneously. And it, if I could also plug, um, I'm teaching at Ken Bozeman's um, acoustic voice pedagogy workshop this summer. Wonderful. Yeah, so I'm not positive when this, this video will, will come out, but it's in, um, uh, I think it's in July july 16th through 20th 21st something like that so maybe we could put a link somewhere in there to that if people are interested in coming because absolutely his work and my work really they they come together really nicely um and so i'm um, i'm excited i'm going to be teaching at that yeah i you may have a, a new person signing up for that very soon <laughs> i would love to, to do something like that so wonderful yeah absolutely we'll put a link to that and i would love to put a link to um the conservatory as well and yeah, great. Kind of have all that together so awesome well thank you so much for your time today absolutely i'm happy to do it and thanks for thank, thanks for doing these i've really enjoyed watching the previous interviews that you've done i think it's a good service
Well, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Do ba do ba do 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 ba do do.